This is an interview with Barbara Davison at her Albany, New York home on May 17, 2010. She served in the United States Naval Reserve Nurse Corps from April 1, 1960 until January 1968. June and Kenneth Hunter are conducting this interview. Please tell us your full name and when and where you were born. Barbara Jean Babin Davison and I was born here in Albany, New York at the Brady Maternity. That was a long time ago. <laughs> and what did you do before you entered the Navy? I was in nursing school at Memorial Hospital in Albany and uh, I had graduated in September but I was only 17. So I worked at Memorial Nights um, and I worked the emergency room and I was assistant night supervisor until I took the oath of office on April 1st, yeah, April Fool's Day, <laughs> 1960. Uh, we also needed at that time to wait for our state boards to come back and they didn't come back till February. So that was the delay. But it was good because it gave me some good practical experience, etc. Why did you enlist in the service? Well, I, I did one of my affiliations in Buffalo, New York at uh, Buffalo Children's. And I was very young. I was uh, 18. And I found pediatrics very, very, very difficult. And it was primarily because of the units I had been assigned to. And um, I'm Catholic and, you know, I have all these moral issues and blah, 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 blah. And the first unit I was assigned to was a, a pediatric unit with uh, infants. And my first assignment was four infants with multiple, multiple congenital anomalies whose bodies were already signed over to Buffalo University. So you would feed them and they would turn blue and you'd have to suction them. And it, it really, really made pediatrics very, very difficult. In fact, I have not really worked peds up until the past 10 years and I have a lot of pediatric clients and I love working with them but I think much of it has to do with the kind of work I do now and also that I'm a grandmother and they see me as a grandmother but it, pediatrics was very difficult for me I almost got kicked out of nursing school because of that little affiliation uh, had to go before kangaroo court here and they decided to keep me and interestingly enough in my state boards Pete's was my highest grade <laughs> but the chief nurse in Buffalo said I would never be a nurse and I should be dropped from the program mm. so then that led you to go in well while I was up there it snowed every single day so uh, it really did. I got there on the 4th of January and I didn't come home until the 4th of April. So one day one of my classmates and me went, took the bus into town. I, I must have been a, a day off. And there was an army recruiter there. And I went in to see her. And I started the paperwork for the army. Okay come back home don't think much more about it and it's time I must have been in my senior year by then and uh, the army calls and wants to visit me at home so she comes and my mother is having a coronary because you know nice girls don't do that and my father's just glowing but my mother was very unhappy and uh, I had a wonderful interview with this army nurse and then she starts telling me about bivouacs and uh, all this and that and the other thing. And I got to thinking, I hate camping. Why would I go into the army? 
I don't belong in the army. I, I don't want to go on any bivouacs. So I went down to the Navy recruiting office and I like the Navy's uniforms. Now that's a real good reason to go into the Navy, but I did. And it was really a good choice. Uh, <laughs> but that's how I wound up in the Navy and not the Army. I, I have such high respect for Army nurses because we all worked. Don't misunderstand me, but they work under horrible conditions, really horrible. And they're out on the front lines all the time. I just recently took my seven-year-old granddaughter to see South Pacific and of course that's Navy also and I gotta tell you it brought back so many wonderful memories because I was stationed in Iceland and that too is an island not in the South Pacific but uh, and it was it was just terrific terrific but that's how I got in the Navy. Now, tell <clears throat> how your basic training uh, was for the well, Navy. Well, I was the eighth nurse's company to go to uh, I live right near the airport. And it's a beautiful sunny day. And I have a son who is a pilot because of all of the planes that f fly overhead. Now, I wasn't at Providence. I, I keep forgetting that. Uh, For your basic training. Yeah, I crossed it out because... Oh, dear. You're not sure. No, I am sure. It was Rhode Island. Quonset Point, Rhode Island? No, no, not Quonset. Um, Newport? Newport. It's right there, see, because I crossed okay. out. Well, I drove my little 1949 coupe, which I got for graduation from nursing school, and it cost $100. Mm. And let me tell you, that was my baby, and I drove it to Newport. And not, you know, I'm a nurse. I had really not a clue what I was, I can't imagine what it would have been like if I'd gone Army, because it was crazy enough going Navy. I pull into this officer's quarter and I'm greeted by a line lieutenant by the name of Lieutenant Hun. I will never, never forget it. White gloves, blue uniform. <laughs> and she was a real knockout. <laughs> and I can't remember exactly the words, but what they told me was I was to turn port, go down the gangway, and then I could turn starboard, and don't... And I'm looking at her, trying to figure out where I'm supposed to be going. After all, I chose the Navy because of the uniform, <laughs> and not a clue. Well, up until this point, Nurses didn't go through this kind of, of officer candidate stuff. We sort of did the same as the doctors and the chaplains and all the rest, because we're staff, we're not lying. Oh my goodness, was I in for a rude awakening. Oh my goodness. I, we had white glove inspections, we had all of that. I used to get stars for my beds. Oh no, they were never good enough for Lieutenant Hunt. But Lieutenant Hunt did one thing that really rattled my cage. We had a white glove inspection and you had to hang everything from port to starboard and you had to, your dresser drawer had to be that way. I could never figure out what to do with my bras. How do you put a bra in a dresser drawer going from port to starboard? So I put all my bras out in my car trunk, and that way I never had to be graded <laughs> on my bras. I do not know how I got out of base, out of officer candidate school. I don't. Then Lieutenant Hunt another time says to me, "Well, you're the t third tallest one in the company. Now there's only eight of us, 
and we're wearing these nun shoes, Oxfords with the heel. Well, I can't walk and chew gum at the same time and I kept turning my ankles and blah, blah, blah. So she says, you're going to be a company uh, commander. And I said, I'm going to be a what? Yes, you're the third tallest one in the company. Okay. I didn't, I really couldn't tell her that the only way I know my right from my left is to bless myself. <laughs> I lasted two days as a company commander. <laughs> she put me back in. <laughs> but you know, I, and we'd, we'd have to stand guard over exit signs and all this craziness, which isn't what nurses do. If you're on nights, you've got patients to watch, mm -hmm. not the shower room to check and the exit signs. But it was an experience. It really, really was an experience. And from there, I went to Pensacola, Florida. Um, I went with a gal from Boston. We drove down. Uh, my first, first, first introduction to um, different water fountains for whites and blacks, because this was 1960. Um, different says I, I knew nothing of this. I mean, I've I often accused my mother and father of totally sheltering us uh, because I grew up in Albany, New York. Well, maybe they didn't know either. And um, no, they didn't. I mean, mm -hmm. how do you prepare mm -hmm. for this? It, it was, I just finished reading The Help, which is about this era with, with blacks and whites. And it was honestly the beginning of segregation and, and that sort of thing. And again, that brought back mm -hmm. so many memories of Pensacola. Pensacola was great and, and one of the the one of the things they did in Pensacola was train the flyboys to do the carrier qualifications and they would use my kitchen table to bring them in and set them down with all the sound effects. And after I started studying hypnosis, I was a terrible dental patient. And uh, once I got into hypnosis, I got better at being a dental patient. And then just out of the blue one day in the dentist's office, when he turned on the drill, it was the guys landing on the table again because it was all the same kinds of sounds. And that served me well, really well. And we had one big party when, when the crew graduated. And uh, we, we lived, there was a bunch of us from the base, nurses, doctors, uh, pilots, etc., who lived in this uh, apartment complex right on the bay. And it was called Peyton Place, of all things, Peyton Place. So we had this big beach party, and we were having a wonderful time. And nobody was out of line because, I mean, we could all get canned, and we knew it. Police came, said we were making too much noise, and it was like, huh? So we broke up the next day. The landlady, who was Italian, sees me, and she starts, You don't pay the taxes here! You don't own property here. And I said, what are you talking about? She said, we don't have blacks partying here. And again, it was that whole thing of segregation because mm -hmm. in the military, there wasn't that. Mm -hmm. You didn't have that feel and I didn't have it being a Yankee. Mm -hmm. So it was very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. Pensacola was a fabulous first duty station for me. I had varied uh, experience. Uh, I loved it. I was USNR, so I had to fill out a dream sheet uh, to re-up. And I did, and I put down any warm weather duty station. My orders came in in March, and it was for Keflavik Iceland. 
I called my mother here in Albany and said, my mother accepted everything very negatively. And you give her two to four days and she turned it around. And if you changed your mind, you were dead. So I said, Mom, I really do need a pair of boots and a winter coat, blah, 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 because I didn't have any of those things after being two years in Florida. And she says to me, well, you just call them up and tell them you don't want to go. And I thought, sure, that's what I'm going to do. By the time I got back to Albany in May, I had enough foul weather gear to outfit all seven of us up there. But uh, yeah, that's what my mom's idea was. And I went to Keflavik in June of uh, 62. Yeah, I was there for 13 months. Keflavik was by far my best duty station. It's uh, <laughs> considered isolated. <laughs> I wonder why, you know. Um, we, the Navy, this was our second tour in Iceland. The Air Force had had, had Iceland prior mm -hmm. to this. And you lived right on, on the air base, which belonged to Keflavik. So it's their air base as well as ours. There was a commander who was chief nurse. There were two lieutenant commanders. There was, that's three, there were three lieutenant commanders, and then there was a lieutenant, and there were three JGs. So, you know, we did all the evenings, all the nights. <laughs> but we had, we lived in uh, the BOQ. The priest had the room underneath me. Uh, it, Father Hunkins, and he would say, just signal me by flushing the toilet. Our big bone of contention was that all the teachers lived in the BOQ as well. And uh, the officer wives grouped the nurses with the teachers. I guess we were a threat to the men. I don't know. Another airplane. So that too was not a, you know, uncommon for me. When I was in Iceland, I had the ability to come back on a, a we brought patients back to the States every so often. I got, I got to bring a ferry a patient back. We got to go to Europe on our leave. Um, I visited all over Iceland. Iceland is an incredible, incredible island. And I, I've written stories about Iceland, and I would just love to get back there with this whole volcano yes. thing going on right now. But Iceland is, uh, is interesting, interesting. The camaraderie was incredible, incredible up there. Um, I was there during the Bay of Pigs, and um, a lot of the flyboys would come up from the choir because we flew the dew line around uh, Iceland for the submarines. And um, everything was so hush-hush during the Bay of Pigs. And we had Operation High Heel going on. Nobody knew what it was all about until everything was over and done with. When I first got up there in June, we had the opportunity that and that June 23rd is the longest day of the year and it literally in the summertime there's no night time so thank God I took the chief nurse with us and we flew to the um, Arctic Circle for a southern fried chicken picnic and the, the poor fly boy got in trouble that since the chief nurse was the commander, etc. We sort of were able to walk, 
<laughs> wash it over. But there were so many instances like that that I so remember. It was warm. It was friendly. We didn't have Christmas trees because the families got them. There are no trees in Iceland, only bushes because of the wind. It, it was just a fabulous, fabulous duty station. How was it in the winter? In the winter, you were on the buddy system the entire time because the wind blew so bad. Uh, they had actually a railing that went from the officers club all the way to the BOQ to hold on to. And because I was the Lieutenant JG, um, the ambulance would come pick us up and, and bring us back because it was too dangerous for us to And uh, did you have almost 24 hours of darkness? Yes. At that time? yes. And, and you require more sleep. A lot of people didn't do well with it. You saw a lot of depression. You saw a lot of that kind of stuff. A lot of broken noses. Because people would bend to walk against the wind, and then the wind would let up and they'd fall. It was, it was an incredible duty station. Um, and looking, you know, hindsight always being better than foresight, it was definitely my very best. I just, two, three years ago, I went to Alaska, because that's also another place I was interested in. And I have to tell you, I was disappointed with Alaska, because I thought, oh, it'll be a lot like Iceland. Well, it isn't. It's entirely different. It is a, a rainforest, so it's dreary. Very dreary. Beautiful, but dreary. Mm -hmm. Iceland, you go down the road, and on one side you see lush green with all the mountain goats in, in the hills in a waterfall, and on this side, the rocks of the cold North Atlantic. And it's a volcanic, so you can only go around the perimeter. The interior of Iceland is all volcanic. Mm -hmm. Incredible, incredible. I came back to the States and I was uh, stationed at St. Albans out on Long Island. I, another incredible duty station. I had very, very, very varied duties. Uh, I worked QTB for uh, almost a year. Now what's QTB? Tuberculosis. Oh, mm -hmm. And now you don't even hear about it, but and I never converted my skin test. It was while I was working TB that uh, JFK was killed. Mm -hmm. And I, I can vividly remember where I, w I was on evenings. And I did a lot of medical surgical. Um, had a 15-year-old son of, uh, I think he, he was Air Force, the father. and. He could, I don't remember why we had him, because we would take in some of the women that were wives of, uh, of the military there. Uh, but he was on a male surgical unit, and he had cancer of the throat. And so clearly, clearly remember this child. And he was 15, so he was almost an adult. But to see how the fellas took him under their wing and really took wonderful, wonderful care of him. And he was part of our unit. And after he died, for years, years, I got Christmas cards from his family. From uh, St. Albans, I had, the chief nurse I had at uh, St. Albans was Alice Riley, and she wanted me to go regular Navy so that I could go to school full time and get my bachelor's and blah, blah. I had been accepted into the Navy with their knowing, which is so crazy, that I had an underactive thyroid. I mean, it was well documented men at, at the age of 13. So by all that's holy, I never should have been accepted. 
Okay, I take one little crazy pill for this. Well, I apply to go regular Navy, and this thyroid thing crops up, so they put me in the hospital for two weeks for a total workup. And when it all came back, it was, yeah, she is hypothyroid, blah, blah. And then the papers came from Washington, and I was denied. Mm -hmm. So I knew I would not have a full career in the military. Because then, if you were active duty reserve, you might make commander. You might make lieutenant commander. But you wouldn't go any higher than that. And of course, then, there were so few captains in the Navy Nurse Corps. So it came back, I was denied, and um, Captain Riley was, was upset, but I, nothing we could do about it. So I get orders then to Bainbridge, Maryland. Boy, what another rude, rude awakening, mm. right where the big Ku Klux Klan crosses are and, and all of that. And I, again, I'm like, I'm in foreign territory. I was at Bainbridge for a year. It was probably my worst duty station. It was very, very difficult. Again, we didn't have many nurses, probably 10. We did everything. We rotated through. One of the hardest things was the female enlisted recruits coming in, and we'd do their physicals. And how many of these young women were abused prior to coming into the Navy, either by fathers, uncles, boyfriends, anybody? Mm -hmm. And um, it, w it was really, really difficult. I met my husband while I was at Bainbridge. He worked for the Pentagon at the time. He was ex-military. And I put in for St. Albans because that's where he was. And I uh, got orders to St. Albans and uh, we got married. And I was there from 66 to 68. That was a fabulous duty station. I had a male uh, surgical enlisted unit. But then when you did evenings and nights, you needed to rotate to the tower, which was all of the uppity ups. It was uh, officers and representatives and senators and everything, chief justices, a anything you could imagine. And, um, and you did supervision. And let me tell you, they could get anything they wanted. I remember them bringing in a king-size bed for one of the either senators or representatives that was so large he couldn't fit into a twin bed. It was while I was there, because Captain Riley was also there, and I love, I, I made lieutenant, I made lieutenant at uh, St. Albans, actually. Uh, she calls me in and she says, Barbara, President Johnson's coming in for da 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 and I want you to head the team. And I said, oh, please, please don't do that to me. Don't do that to me. What do you mean? I said, because he's not a nice man and he has very heavy, roaming hands. And I'll get court-martialed. So we talked about it, and we talked about it, and I kept saying, I really, and I, I don't know that I do that well with Lady Bird and those girls either. And uh, so finally she says, well, you realize you will have to do supervision for the whole time he's in. And that was always such a drag, because you'd ride the elevators with all these Secret Service people, and you know, and when you're on supervision, whatever, the team couldn't take care of, you had to take care of. Although I enjoyed su supervision because I got to meet so many amazing people, chief justices and senators. One of my fondest memories was taking care of Muriel, Muriel Humphrey when she was in, 
And I, I did have a thank you note from her. I, I have no idea where, where it is at this point. And taking care of Hubert Humphrey, they were just incredible people. And I do have his thank you. But my military career was fabulous. Uh, I was pregnant for my first child, and uh, that's why I got out January of uh, 68. Then you could not stay in, you had to get out. Uh, and they didn't have any uniforms or anything that you could wear. And uh, so I did. But I, I so enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. And it so, so prepared me. I, because it was so varied for um, everyday nursing on the outside. In some ways and in other ways, it was difficult because in the military you did it. Mm -hmm. And it's not that way on the outside. Now I know you had mentioned there were certain patients that you particularly remember. Mm -hmm. um, would you like to discuss any of those? Or? Yeah, there's a couple of them. Uh, there's two from when I was at Bethesda. Well, I told you about the young man at, at St. Alban. Let, I'll go back to Iceland. Oh my God. Every Friday, I think it was Friday, was circumcision day up there. And many of the men would wait if they hadn't been circumcised earlier and have it done while they were in Iceland because it was isolated duty. And if you brought your family, you did two years. If you didn't, you did uh, 13 months. So they, we'd have circumcision day, and that would be hysterical. And just really hysterical how mean they could be to one another and how mean the corpsmen could be. And I say mean because it was fun mean, you know, uh, picking on them big time. And now the, all this talk about circumcision is probably not being necessary at all. <laughs> and these guys really went through some changes up mm -hmm. there, some really big changes. And then when there were always special people everywhere I was. I, I you know, I remember some of the guys when I was at uh, St. Albans. And the, the female recruits at Bainbridge, and then at um, St. Albans. There was a young man named Berrios, I think he was 19, having a male surgical unit, they would, and they were getting guys back within 24 to 36 hours, so they were still very, very fresh. And this was from the Vietnam War? Uh-huh, uh-huh. And, uh, they brought him in, middle of the night, blind, multiple wounds, severe wounds. His parents came and they were Hispanic to see him. And they were so gracious, so very, very gracious and attentive to their son and to all of us, which to see your 19 year old son like this, mm -hmm. I, I just, as a mother, I just can't imagine it. I, I can't, I can't imagine it in my wildest dreams. And it was interesting because after we talked, and I'm going through some of the stuff I have, I have the newspaper clip mm -hmm. from that. And it just it, it really made it I don't know how he could have survived the multiple wounds he had. Um, although they're surviving now with multiple, multiple yeah. injuries. There was another fellow. God, he was good looking. He was an Italian, real stud, you know, handsome guy. And he came back with multiple stomach wounds. 
took us a good ten months to get him to be so he would he could go out on leads and, and um, passes and things like that. And PTSD was talked about, yeah, but it wasn't as big as it is now. I found it much bigger once I went to work at the VA. It's post-traumatic syndrome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And clearly, this fellow had it. And um, he went out on a pass and got drunk and wrecked his car and killed himself after going through all that he had gone through. And so, and even the corpsman said, I wonder if he did it on purpose. The nightmares, all of that, mm -hmm. you, you got to witness. And I found it very interesting. While I was at the VA, I was uh, working detox. When I came back to Albany in 76, I went to work at the VA here in Albany, and I worked chemical dependency and later chemical and drugs. Uh, I did that for about 25 years and I'm sitting in on a group and one of the guys is talking about all well, the, you didn't know anything if you didn't serve in country. And I got to thinking and let me tell you, let me tell you, there is such a thing as secondhand PTSD. I didn't serve in country but you felt the pain. Mm -hmm. You felt the anguish they went through. And you saw them work so hard mm -hmm. on their own recovery. I also need to compliment the Army nurses that were in country with, with these men. And I can't even begin to imagine what it was like for them because I know what it was like for me. Did some of the uh, women get this post-traumatic syndrome as well? We, you didn't see it. There weren't enough m women. If we were, we were nurses. And of course, I didn't find any of our nurses. You didn't talk about it. You didn't talk about it. Mm -hmm. hmm. Interesting. But. Well, many times I had repeat nightmares and all of that. Now I look at it differently and I thank God for that. Mm -hmm. I, I guess I've finally gotten it into perspective, but it, w it was an incredible, incredible eight years. So in, uh, now th your service brought you to do work at the VA hospital as mm -hmm. a civilian and I assume you've notice treatments have gotten better? Or well, when I was that? first, while I was at VA, I was there from uh, 1976 to 1987. Uh, yes and no is the answer. Uh, the chemical dependency unit was disbanded. And we used to have a saying, if it's working, they're going to fix it. And that's exactly what they did. And uh, then a nurse was a nurse was a nurse. And it didn't matter where you worked. Um, and that's not really true because we invested dollars and education and everything else in becoming a credentialed alcohol and substance abuse counselor and, and you know, just becoming the best that we could be. And I was. Uh, put on psych, um, not as a patient, as a nurse. <laughs> that didn't come out quite right. Um, and psych, and I don't mix very well. I'm very good at it. Um, but I find the treatment is more geared to keeping them ill than it is to getting them well. Um, whereas with chemical dependency back then, when I was doing chemical dependency, um, was more helping them 
to help themselves become whole again. And that's more my holistic kind of thinking. But to get any, that was also the period of time when they were putting chemical dependency under psych, and, which is where it is now. And I, and I have certain qualms about that. Do I think there is dual addiction, you know, with psychiatric component? And yes, I do. But, you know. Yeah. Now, uh, have you, uh, since you've been out of the service, been active in any of the military organizations? No. Is there a reason for that? Uh, you had your fill of military. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, not that at all. I still listen to, you know, Anchors Away and all. That's all shipping over music for crying mm -hmm. out loud. And it just fills, fills me. Mm -hmm. uh, to the point where two or three years ago, for my birthday from uh, my kids, I wanted. Uh, three bricks purchased up at the crossings in the mm -hmm. Veterans Memorial. One for my son Larry, who was Navy, one for me, I'm Navy, and one for my son Lee, who was Air Force. Mm -hmm. And um, there are ten rows down, and I can't remember how many rows over to the right, and all the grandkids have seen it. Mm -hmm. and so no, it's not that at all. Uh, when I was still married, uh, my husband, being ex-military, uh, was involved with the Kiwanis and DAV and this and that and the other thing. But there weren't a lot of women then. And then my life just got so busy, mm -hmm. uh, raising three kids and working and going to school and doing all that kind of stuff. I had limited time. Um, and there really wasn't any real point mm -hmm. in uh, belonging to any of the organizations. Mm -hmm. So it, no, it never had anything to do with mm -hmm. anything, really. Yeah. Just busy and mm -hmm. a different time. Yeah. Different time in our history. Okay. Well, in the service, uh, what kind of shifts did you have uh, at the various hospital posts? There, you had a day, an evening, and a night shift. Uh, I, if I worked evenings or nights, I was on supervision. And what they would do is every three months, you'd do a shift of evenings. And you would um, have the weekend off. You'd work 10 days straight. And then you'd have the weekend off, and you'd go back to your day duty. If you worked nights, and that was three months after you worked evenings, you would do the same thing and it was every three months. I had no other nurse on the unit with me. I had all corpsmen. How and easy, I didn't have any core waves. How easy was it to get leave and what was the procedure like? It was complicated. <laughs> and you had to put in way, way ahead, way ahead. Um, emergency leave, they, you know, for deaths and stuff like that, they would, make uh, allowances for but no it, it was cut in stone and even if you were sick you had to go in to sick call before you were declared off duty I can remember going into the city when I was at uh, uh, down in Long Island uh, and I had gone to a play I took the subway in went to a play, and I'm coming out to get back on the subway. And my high heel got caught in one of the grates, and I went forward, and my hand came down like this. Well, I sat on that subway like this. The reason I went to the play is because the guy I was dating lived up in Beacon, and he canceled our date because he broke a leg skiing. And I was kind of ticked because we had these tickets for the play and I had the time off and blah, blah, blah. 
well, I get home, I don't know what to do with this hand. It hurts so bad. I had a shift car, shift sports car, and I'm driving from where the subway let me off back to my apartment. It was hysterical. So I remember rigging a belt around it to hold it up like this on my bedpost till morning. Well, I got up in the morning, and I, I, I'd been awake all night. The hand is throbbing. I'm thinking, I can't drive. And you can't just call in and say, I'm not coming in. So I called the cab. I thought he was going to kill me by the time we got there. We hit every pothole imaginable. I get there, and the supervisor says, well, I guess you're going to have to go to orthopedics. We'll call in orthopedics to look at you, because it was Sunday, Saturday or Sunday. Well, I get a call saying I can go see him at 11 o'clock, and he's got my hand, and he's doing this and this and this, and I'm right-handed beside. And all of a sudden, he does this. They scrape me off the ceiling and casted me, and he said, you dislocated the carpal lunate when you did it. So when he pulled those fingers, the carpal lunate popped back into place. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. I got the rest of the day off, but I had to report Every day. the following day. And they gave me, do I couldn't give shots, I couldn't write. I couldn't really drive my car, but I managed to, you know, when you're young. And uh, come to find out, then, then, Nick called. I didn't know he had broken his leg, but I know he broke the day. He broke his leg, and I dislocated my hand, so we looked like one battered couple. <laughs> While we were up in Iceland, well, how was the relationship with the military and the people of Iceland? I got along fine because I'm not blonde. My roommate was blonde. The men had to wear their uniforms into town. The women did not because there were only seven of us. Claire was blonde and could pass for Icelandic and uh, they would make nasty remarks and give her a lot of grief if she went into town with any of the guys. I never got any grief because I didn't look Icelandic. And the primary reason being that uh, they lost so many of their women to military personnel. And they didn't return. While up in Iceland, do you have any traveling uh, entertainers like the USO? Do they have any kind of show? I don't remember the USO coming to Iceland, ever. And that's the only isolated duty station, other than Bainbridge. And believe me, Bainbridge is isolated. Um, so no, no. But we, we did our own thing. I mean, we really did. Everything was a party. Everything was, it, it was so cohesive there. It really, really was. Christmas was the best Christmas out of all of my military years. What did they do special or different? It was always together. Thanksgiving was together. We were a group. We, it was like... A family. Yeah, it wasn't like a family. It was a family. It was a family. We were all in the same predicament. And do you ever hear from any of the people? I'm still best friends with Claire. Mm. Uh, in fact, when we were coming out of Iceland, I had requested New York because of this fellow I was dating, and she had requested Pennsylvania. She got New York, and I got Pennsylvania, but they allowed us to switch. Mm -hmm. That's nice. So you're still in touch today. Then. Yes. In fact, she was, uh, she, she became a nurse anesthetist. Uh, she did go regular. Uh, she became a nurse anesthetist. She served 17 years. Hmm. When you left the military, how did you get home? Did they, you have to pay your own way home? Did they provide transportation for you? 
When I left the military, I was living in uh, Northern Virginia. I was already married. Uh, I don't quite remember that. I know... I don't remember that. I, I because I was living right there and I was going to continue to live there. I lived in uh, Northern Virginia for a total of almost 12 years. Um, I know they gave me my ret retirement money and it was while I was at the VA uh, that something came across that said you could buy it back. Somebody put a bug in my ear and said, you really ought to do that. It's worth, um, you know, the hardship of it all. And when I left in 1987, I then had 19 years government service. And um, I went to see a lawyer. And I said, in 87, the stock market was great. I said, I People say I should pull it out and invest it, blah, blah, blah. And I just did, didn't feel right. He looked at it and he said, you leave it just the way it is because they will have to pay you for the rest of your life. And thank God, thank God I did that. Because I'll tell you, my, my retirement after 10 years at Samaritan Hospital Northeast Health is two hundred and sixteen dollars and I think forty three cents a month mm -hmm. which is ridiculous mm -hmm. um, I also had the opportunity to have enough quarters for Social Security but because oh, the peanut guy the peanut president oh uh, Carter Jimmy Carter Jimmy Carter signed this thing I have brain farts. <laughs> That's what <laughs> happened. Uh, this thing that said it's double dipping. They gave me extra money because I was a Vietnam era veteran. And then they took it all away plus more because I was considered double dipping. <coughs> And the one it affects the most is women, because they depend on that money, especially if they're single like I am. Well, Hillary Clinton was supposed to sign off on this thing and get it canceled, and it was supposed to come up in Congress in, like, October, and 9-11 occurred, and it, we heard nothing after that. Now, double dipping, if you're way up there in rank, is one thing. I was, I was a lieutenant, and we didn't get paid that much back then. Now, you met something here to, for comparison purposes. You mentioned being uh, at Bainbridge there, and you probably had uh, uh, female recruits there. Can you t notice any difference what basic training was like when you went in and to then? They were enlisted. Enlisted is treated very, very differently than officer. And and I, I don't, I am not trying to sound uppity or cast a lot mm -hmm. of disparaging things between the two levels. Uh, but I said that to both my sons, I said, they went in right after high school. I said, it's going to be tough. Well, it was tough for them. I can't honestly say it was tough for me. I can't. I can't imagine what it was like for those female recruits, because they were all enlisted. As an officer, I was Navy, I will admit, and we were really treated well. Um, I can't say that ever occurred. Ever. Mm -hmm. Even though I was in through all of the Vietnam era, 60 to 68, um, 
I didn't even get disparaging stuff uh, on the outside. Anything else? If you had to do it all over again, would you do the same Absolutely. thing? Absolutely. And I'd go Navy, not Army. <laughs> I don't do bivouacs. <laughs> to me, camping is going to a hotel or a motel without room service. <laughs> Okay, well, on that note, thank you so much for your service oh, to our country. My pleasure to speak That's with fine. both of you. Okay, thank you.